Hey everybody, this is Hercules Penix, founder, curator, docent, and gift shop employee of the Hercules Penix Academy of Comic Book Studies. Today we're going to be looking at Ditko Kirby Wood by Sergio Poncioni. Or, yeah, I think that's how you pronounce it. Uh, he's an Italian cartoonist, well regarded uh, in the European comics uh, community. I never heard about him until this comic came out from Fanographics. It's a reprint of an Italian comic, originally published in Italy, and Fanographics reprinted it. Obviously, because the the uh, American interest in the topic, and uh, this is just a loving tribute from uh, Sergio to uh, three of the greatest comic artists who ever lived, and uh, just um, very interesting, weird little comic. So I guess technically it's called DKW, colon, semicolon, Ditko Kirby Wood. I'm sorry, colon. I love this little logo, you know, like on the cover too. It's just great. Just his um, pastiche of uh, their uh, styles. Introduction by Blake Bell, comic book historian. He did a book on Ditko. So we see this cartoonist, and he is a visitor. I think this is supposed to be Sergio. And some young cartoonist, God, that guy looks like a douchebag. <laughs> he comes to visit him. He wants to show him his art, and you know, get some tips from a master cartoonist, or at least a more popular, uh, experienced cartoonist. And uh, he mentions, uh, Ditko, Kirby, and Wood, and the kid doesn't even know who they are. And he's like, dude, if you want to be a cartoonist, you need some history. You got to know these guys. And instead of just, like, telling him about it, it's all these, like, little fantasy things. So he says, look at the spot on that wall. And the spot starts moving, and it turns into a D. And uh, we see a very Ditko-like art style within the D. I believe this is, uh, Ditko did some work for Warren uh, publications, Creepy and Eerie and such. And uh, I think he did a, this is an homage to a splash page from one of those, if memory serves correctly. The Mysterious Steve. So we see it's 2014 and Manhattan. And, uh, you know, in the past few years, all these blockbuster Spider-Man movies have come out, of which Steve Ditko didn't get one penny, even though he created Spider-Man. And the camera zooms in to Steve Ditko's office. He had a studio in this building for decades. And uh, he says once in a while... An, un an uninvited fan or an enterprising journalist will knock on his door only to hear a standard reply, I have nothing to say. I am my work. I do my best. And if I like the result, I hope that others will too. And uh, he's like the J.D. Salinger of comics did go. There's a... Until his death, when his uh, relatives released some of the photos of him... The last photo of Steve Ditko was from 1959. It's kind of amazing. He just never had his picture taken. Very interesting guy, Steve Ditko. Very influenced by Ayn Rand. Objectivism. Oh, this is just a great page. Just showing all of his creations. Well, not all of them, but a lot of them. And his later ones like Speedball. Mr. A... He really captures the Spider-Man, the Ditko era Spider-Man well. And there's the picture from 1959. I really like the sepia on this. Just gives it a nice nostalgic edge. And so then he hands him the Steve Ditko book that Blake Bell wrote. 
It's like a little advertisement almost. So uh, then he says, okay, come outside with me. Uh, I'm going to continue your your lesson. And this giant K comes out of from outer space. It's like a K-shaped monolith, which makes sense because Kirby was always drawing science fiction and science fiction concepts. K is for Kirby, planet Kirby. And we see this alien guy going to this planet and his rocket ship or his UFO. And he's bringing some stuff to him. And when he goes over this crest, he sees this amazing sight. It's just like a, a Kirby extravaganza. All crazy Kirby concepts, Kirby crackle in the sky, cosmic beings, weird aliens. You could tell this guy had so much fun drawing this shit, Sergio Poncioni. And they're all holograms. So he makes it to this like dwelling, this weird cosmic space dwelling. And uh, Jack Kirby's there. He buzzes him in. Hi, Jack. Here, here come the supplies. And uh, so I guess at the moment of his death, these aliens snatched Jack Kirby to this planet. And they get, give him this uh, drawing board. Everything he draws instantly becomes a hologram. It creates it. And Jack's all like, oh, man, I wish I had one of these back when I was alive on Earth. And this guy's bringing him tons of paper and ink, gallons of ink, and food and stuff. Rings of paper and gallons of ink, which probably Jack Kirby would go through in like a month. So uh, basically, it's an amusement park. P Planet Kirby. And so just tell Jack Kirby, I guess for who knows how long, will just draw and his crazy imagination will be made uh, manifest in these holograms and people can come watch. I would definitely go to that amusement park. And then he hands him the Kirby book, where Mark every year. It's almost like product placement. I wonder if he uh, got a little money. The K monolith flies off and back off into space. Then he shows up about Wally Wood. He says, concentrate on his name. Wood used to always uh, spell his name in this weird, like, medieval font. And the W changes. And this is just a little uh, pro story. Really nice drawings. This is Wood in 1968, a photo. I think I saw that photo once in a magazine. He was everything a cartoonist should and shouldn't be, an enormous cursed talent, a tormented union of passion and pain. His dedication to his craft combined with his love for the bottle put his health at risk. If it's true that what you love destroys you, Wood is a shining example. So I don't know if you guys know about Wally Wood, but he, he was a pretty sad guy and uh, drank too much, smoked too much, but he loved comics and he worked just so hard. It actually impacted his health, not just the alcohol and the tobacco. He just was a workaholic, always trying to top himself, always trying to make the most beautiful page he could. And he would never skimp. Well, in his later years, he started to, when he got his health started failing. But it eventually caught up to him. He died pretty young. We see reproductions of a lot of his panels from EC Comics and his spirit. When he drew the spirit for Will Eisner. It seems like he uh, has an affinity for wood. It seems like it's easier for him to draw this kind of shading and stuff. So this is pretty much just describing, you know, his sad life, but also his triumphs, like how great he was. Almost everyone was in awe of Wally Wood. When his pages would come in to the EC offices, everyone would stop what they were doing and be and ooh and ah over them. 
he just had this style that was kind of had universal appeal. Worked in advertising because of that. He could have made a lot of money just working in advertising. He was kind of a, a big deal in that world. But he uh, loved comics so much, which paid shit. So we had to churn him out. He had to work like a you know, motherfucker just to pay the rent. Some of his stuff from Mad. The Mad Comics. And this shows like the 60s heyday. Him drawing Daredevil. His fanzine Whitson that he self-published and had all his friends draw. I think that's a panel from Big Apple Comics, which he contributed to that semi-underground. And his Wizard Kings series. That was like his, uh, I guess, magnum opus, you know. It was a big graphic novel. Yeah, and Wally Wood shot himself. Uh, killed himself with a gun November 1st, 1981. He, uh, he might have lived a little longer. He, his kidneys were shot. And he, uh, he, had, he was staring down the prospect of dialysis. And he blinked. That's what he writes. So I guess just the pain of having to do dialysis and the annoyance of it. He just was like, fuck this. Is it really worth going on? He just killed himself. Rather than deal with the trouble of all that shit. Once again, another book placement. And then we see uh, the little, the young cartoonist leaves and Sergio is talking to his editor, it sounds like. And uh, says, yeah, I just finished the comic. We should, we should have it printed before the Luca Festival. And it's obviously the comic that we just read. That old kind of, that's kind of an old twist in a lot of comic stories. Not very good. <laughs> the kind of stuff uh, between the art, the two cartoonists, not very good. The art's beautiful, great cartooning. But really, I just love the homage pages where he's aping uh, to go Kirby and Wood. This is nice. We have nice little biographies of, of the three titans of cartooning. Really like that one, Jack Kirby. And uh, Sergio Poncioni himself. Pretty studly looking guy. So I guess his uh, big comic in America was Grotesque, published by Coconino Press and Fanographics. But uh, he's won a lot of awards. And we have a little back cover here. I guess it's technically a wraparound cover. Pretty nice little odd, odd comic. Uh, just a loving tribute by one cartoonist to three other ones. That would be great if he just kept doing these. He's like, I don't know who the D, it could be like Kurtzman, Wolverton. I can't think of anyone who starts with a D right now. Um, da, 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 da. <laughs> Sorry, I can't think of anyone. I know this must be a cartoonist is a, a D. But uh, whatever, who cares? But um, yeah, there it is. DKW, Ditko Kirby Wood. Um, I think these are pretty easy to find. I don't think it sold that well for Fanographics. I have a feeling. He's, I think they published it just because, you know, they're, they're old school comics geeks. You know, Gary Groff put out fanzines in the 70s, early 70s, late 60s. You know, just fanboy stuff. So this is just basically a total fanboy homage but done with a lot of skill so hope you liked it and uh, i definitely want to find more sergio poncioni and uh if i do you'll find about it here uh at the hercules pedics academy of comic book studies